<laughs> You're familiar, I am sure, with the Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol, uh, either because you've read the book or because you've seen one of the many adaptations. I personally like the one that has Mickey Mouse in it. But uh, there, if you have not seen it, I will sum it up for you briefly. There's this rich, old, miserly guy named Scrooge, and he uh, is, there are a series of ghosts that appear to him on Christmas Eve, and they tell him that he should be more charitable, and so he wakes up in the morning, and he decides to change his whole life and be really nice to people. Uh, and I have one problem with this uh, story from a biblical perspective, and that is that ghosts don't actually change anybody's mind. Uh, if you'll turn to Luke chapter 16, I think you'll see what I mean. So, there's, it's a great TV trope that in order to get a good intervention, all you need is, uh, or in order to change someone's mind, you just need a good ghost intervention and that'll do the trick. But, uh, from a Bible perspective, that doesn't seem to be the way it works. There's a parable here in Luke 16 of the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man is a rich man. And Lazarus is this poor guy that lives at his gate. And every day the rich man passes by Lazarus, doesn't help him. The rich man lives sumptuously and Lazarus is super poor and uh, sad. So when they die, Lazarus goes to be in comfort and the rich man goes to torment. And the rich man asks several things. But one of them, uh, we'll pick up in verse 27, is that he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to his, parent, or to his house. So it says in Luke 16, verse 27, And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he might warn them, lest they come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, for if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, I think this is pretty startling to us, but it is an absolute truth that people are really stubborn. And they are so stubborn, in fact, that uh, this story uh, says that even if someone were to rise from the dead and go to speak to these people, that they would not turn from their ways. And I think that we understand this, but people are stubborn and sin is really deceiving. And we have a phenomenal ability to, if we really want to, just ignore everything we know to be the truth, ignore all the consequences we know are going to happen, and just do whatever we want. And I'll show you this from a couple Bible passages. The first is Hebrews chapter 3. It says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. He says, I'm warning you guys, don't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, because it can happen. Sin is deceiving. It will pull you in before you even know what's happening. I'll show you another passage. Flip over to Romans chapter 1. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, and we'll pick up in verse 18, read through verse 25. Romans 1 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of the bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the, creator, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So this is a, it's kind of a, a scary passage. I mean, God is 
bringing wrath on the unrighteous. But you start to read, is it, are these people unrighteous because they don't know any better? Are they unrighteous because they're just, you know, ignorant about what they're, no. Like, it's, it's all over this passage. In verse 18, they suppress the truth. In verse 19, what's known about God is plain to them. In verse 20, they are without excuse. To the point in verse 31, they knew God, but they didn't honor him as God or give thanks. They became futile in their thinking. The thing is that they knew everything they needed to know, but they just chose to ignore it. And so what's God going to do? Well, in verse 24, therefore God gave them up the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. He says, if you're going to act like fools, then just go do that. He gives them up to their lust. And we talked about this a little bit in the last talk, that if we want to do something, God is not going to stop us. God gives us free will. And that is perhaps one of the more terrifying gifts that God gives us. Because the truth is, that we have enormous potential to do good or to do bad. And I know this because I've seen it happen in the Bible, that countless times there were people who knew it was wrong, they knew what it would cost them, they were, you know, they should have been scared by the consequences of their sin, but they were not, and they just did what they wanted to do. I know this is true, because I've seen it in the lives of people I know who are you know, raised in the church. They know that if they keep living this way, they're going to end up in hell. They know that it's tearing apart their family. They know all of this stuff. It's not a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of will. They just don't want to do the right thing. And I know it because I've seen it in my life in much smaller ways than just like leaving and creating chaos. But like in the same exact way, sin enters my life, and I really want to sin. And I know it's going to cost me a lot. I know what will happen if I keep down this path, but I just want to do it. And so I sin. And so there is this stubbornness. There is a willful ignoring of obvious facts. And it's, it's so possible for us. And because of that, I want to talk today about what we do before that. So uh, I say this is a scary problem. We have enormous potential to do wrong. And so what do we do? Like, how do we guard against that? Well, uh, if the truth that we're trying to defend against is that we will ignore or forget things that are inconvenient for us and do whatever we want to do, there is only truly one solution to that, and it's actually a quite simple solution. You just gotta stop wanting to do the wrong thing. Now, of course, that's uh, kind of impossible in a lot of ways. Uh, it would take nothing short of an entire mind restoration by the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's like powerful stuff, lifetimes of work. But ultimately, that's what it takes. Uh, and that's what we're going to end up talking about today, but there are also some practical stuff that we're going to examine along the way. So, I, as I said, I've, I've entitled this lesson, Before You Ignore. If we know that it's possible for us to go off the deep, and if we know it's possible for us to pursue our own desires despite knowing the consequences, then we need to guard against getting there. We need to start long before that preparing ourselves to do God's will. And so I'm going to present you guys with three things that we should be doing that are going to help us fight off sin in our lives, things that we should do before you ignore. So, uh, and in true Pauline fashion, we will begin with the more abstract and we'll move then to the practical. So the first thing I want to say is make Christ your identity. And if you'll be turning to 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, we're going to unpack this idea. But the truth is, people act out of their identity. If you think of yourself as someone who is weak or depraved, you will probably act in such a manner. If you think of yourself as someone who is powerful, uh, then when someone challenges your power, you're going to react with anger. But if you think of yourself as someone who is filled with Christ, 
Let him transform you. If you think of yourself, I am a Christian, that will do incredible things to help you to combat the sins that will challenge you because you will look at them and you'll say, that's not me. We'll look in 1 Thessalonians. We'll start in verse 4. You say, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. The thrust of Paul's argument here is that you are light people. He says, there are people out there, and they're dark people. They're pursuing darkness, they're doing dark things, they're doing things that ought not be done in the light. But that's not who you are. You have been changed by God. You are a Christian. You are a child of light. So act like it. We see this reasoning all the time. I think of it in like sports teams. You know, you think about if there are two football players and uh, they get in a fight, the coach might look at them and say, no, that is not how we act on this team. Now, of course, in some way, it is because those are two people on the team and that is in fact how they acted. But the coach is not making a statement of fact. He's making a normative statement. This is not how you should act. And if you're going to be part of this team, you have to act like part of this team. You have to be part of this team. And it's not enough just to do the things that the team does. You have to embody these virtues. In the same way as Christians, it's not, just, it's not enough just to do the Christian things. We have to embody those virtues, the virtues of Christ, and let Christ lead us to do the right thing. And... So you might be looking at me, you might say, Brent, I don't know about that. Like, I don't know if I can just start thinking about myself as someone who is transformed by Christ. I don't know if I can just be a person of light. Well, I know that you can, and the reason I know that is because of the way Paul talks to the church of, Cor of Corinth. He says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. This is Corinth, the church where there are people taking each other to court, people who are going ahead of each other in the Lord's Supper and just totally wrecking the Lord's Supper. People, there's a guy who has his stepmom and everyone is just like okay with that. That's the church that Paul is talking to and he says, this is who you are. You are people sanctified in Jesus Christ. You are called to be saints together with all the people in every place. He says, you are a child of God just like all the other children of God. That's who you are. And so Paul really starts this, the letter to Corinth on that note and continues making a less direct argument than he makes in Thessalonians, but basically like, look, this is who you are. Be that person. And so, like I said, it's a little bit abstract, but it's all over Paul's argumentation that if we know who we are and we start to act like, the, if we know who we are, then we will start to act like that. And if we make ourselves followers of Jesus, then we will be followers of Jesus. That is a choice we will make, and that's who we'll be transformed into, not entirely by our own power, uh, as we will see here in a moment. Uh, so turn over... I actually don't. I've got it up here on the board. To Ephesians chapter 4. So before this, Paul makes a pretty similar argument to what we've seen all along. He says, uh, you're acting like the Gentiles. That's not how you learn Christ. That's, that's not how we do this, guys. He says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and it's corrupt, uh, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So how do we act like a Christian? How do we change our identity? How do we ground our identity in Jesus? Well, we really have to make ourselves 
ready for the transformation. Because, this, like I said, this isn't something we're going to be able to do on our, on our own. This isn't something we can do through our own power. It's going to be the Spirit's work in transforming our hearts, transforming our minds to make us who God wants us to be. And so, uh, as we pointed out in Ephesians, there are three parts to this. There's uh, take, uh, putting away the old self, there's putting on the new self, and uh, being renewed in the mind. And so we're going to take those, each of them. Uh, the first, we have to put off the old self. And if you'll turn over to Romans 13, uh, Paul is going to make here, he's going to say something very similar. You're going to see a lot of the same arguments that he puts forth in Thessalonians. But there's something here at the end of Romans 13 that I really like. So, in Romans 13, we'll start in verse 12. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Uh, I, I love how this ends. Make no provision for the flesh. When we are being transformed by God, it's not enough to give him 85%. It's not enough to give him 99%. God is expecting our 100%. And a lot of times when we decide, okay, I'm, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to open myself to let him transform me. I'm going to stop being so stubborn. Uh, we hold something back. We say, ah, oh, you know, like, I'm, I'm working on my anger right now, but my, my greed, no, that's, that's like, that's next week. Like, I, I can't do everything at once. Or like, ah, uh, you know, I've just, I've been this way so long, I don't know if I can change that right now. And we, we, we put it off and we, we leave room for Satan to work in our life. We leave room for temptation to get a foothold. And what Paul tells us is he says, make no provision for the flesh. Don't, this is, don't do this 99%. This is a 100% commitment to God. And again, you might say, ah, I don't know if I can do that. And I would, of course, say, uh, you're probably right. Uh, in fact, at, it's clear from the Bible that we cannot do that. But that's why we have to make ourselves ready for God to work in our lives. He is the one that will transform us. He, through his power, through his transformation. He's the one that's going to be doing the work. And so when you feel like, I don't know, I, I don't know if I can do that, you're sitting at a crossroads. A crossroads that says either I'm going to lean into that feeling of I don't know if I can do this, and you're either going to make provision for the flesh, leave Satan a foothold, or worse, you're just going to go off the deep end entirely. The other way you can lean is into faith into the promises of God that he can work in your life to transform you. I'll show you one uh, that I really like. It's in Jude. The last two verses of Jude, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. How does Jude describe the God that we serve? He's a God that can keep you from stumbling and present you blameless. That's the kind of God I want to serve because those are the problems I have. I, I do find myself stumbling. I do find myself blameful. And in those situations, I need God because I need him to work his God magic to help me be what I, what I need to be, to help me grow, to give me the challenges that are going to shape me through his power uh, to be the kind of person I ought to be. And so we have to make ourselves ready for transformation. Uh, let's turn over to Titus, uh, Titus chapter 2. It's another passage, and I, th I think that we will find some more answers to round out this, again, sort of abstract idea. In Titus chapter 2, we'll read verses 11 through 14. He says, For the grace of God, 
has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. I said, look, we're going to ignore on our own. If, if we want to do sin, we're going to do it. And on our own, we have a lot of sinful desires. But the good news is that we don't have to do this on our own. We have Jesus, and as we wait on him to work in our lives, as we give up our stubbornness and make room for the Holy Spirit to transform us, then we will be changed more into the image of God, more into Christ as our identity. And this is an incredible gift. It will transform our lives. It will make us who we ought to be. But it takes time, lifetimes even, mostly because we're stubborn. <laughs> and so we've got these two really nice abstract ideals Make Christ your identity and make yourself ready for transformation. And I truly believe that in this lies the crux of what we need to be doing. Because anything we try on our own is not going to be a foolproof plan. It is only God working in us that will make us what we need to be, that will take away the desire to sin and will put in us a heart to do what is right. But in the meantime we still have struggles. We still have temptations. And so what do we do while we're still angry? What do we do while we're still being tempted? I'll give you one very practical piece of advice, and that is make sin hard. Uh, and like I said, not a foolproof system, because you know it doesn't matter how many barriers you have to jump over. Uh, if you really, really, really want to sin, you will find a way. But the more barriers you put in yourself, the more accountability partners that you have, and you know, the more filters that you have, like, there are ways to keep yourself from sin, to make it harder and harder. And the, the more barriers you put up, the better it's going to be. And so I've, I've heard lots of examples of things that we can do to make sin hard. But I really just want to share one with you today, not because it's on its own good, but it's one that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about. You know, I, I think there's a lot of value in, like I said, accountability partners, value in putting filters on your phone, value in talking to people, finding gratefulness. But the one thing that I would really like to share with you to make sin hard is invest in the things of God. And mostly what that is going to be is relationships with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, See, the people that desert God, they do so, uh, yes, because they have ignored all the things that they know to be true. Yes, because they, there is a, a forgetfulness. But at some level, they have weighed it in the balance. And they have decided that in some way, it's worth it. Because hell is too far off to be really convincing. And God is not near enough to be a compelling relationship. And so they leave. But if we can connect ourselves in with the church, connect ourselves to other people, to this community of believers, the further we invest ourselves in it, the more we are going to have to give up to turn away from God, and the harder it's going to be to stay in sin, because we're going to be so connected to one another. And this is, of course, what the author of Hebrews was saying in Hebrews 3. Uh, Take care, my brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That if we are together, we can be exhorting one another so that we are not hardened. And so we get connected. We get uh, we get teamed up, and we, we start to value the things of God. I mean, very few people, uh, I, I will say, by and large, it is true that people who are really connected to their friends have a hard time staying angry at their friends because they can't 
they can't stomach the time that it takes away from their relationship to remain angry. And so, yes, they might sin, but they're going to return to their friends. And people who truly value their families don't just leave. And so the more that we can value the people of God, the more we can get connected to them, the deeper uh, that we're going to be held by the connections that we have. And this isn't just a biblical truth or a practical truth. It is a scientific truth as well. One of my very favorite TED Talks uh, is about the connection between community and addiction. And basically what he says is uh, that we th often think about uh, drugs and alcohol uh, being a chemical connection and that that's the reason people can't shake it. But he argues differently. He says, yeah, that's, there's something to that. But the thing about uh, addiction that sucks people in is that it gives them connection. And when they have done studies where they take people and they put them back in their jobs, they connect them to their families, they show them love, they make them a part of something, then they don't need it as much. And what I love about this TED Talk is not that I know anything about being addicted to drugs, but that I do know what it's like to be sucked in by sin. Uh, and what I know is that I am tempted to sin when I don't feel as connected to people. But when I am having a, a wonderful relationship with my friends, with my wife, then like I don't feel as strong of a desire to sin because I'm happy the way things are. God has blessed me enough. I don't need sin mucking up what's going well. And so as we start to connect, as we start to really value the things of God, the more we do that, the more it's going to help us. Now, of course, as I've said this whole time, not a foolproof system, but very helpful is connecting to people and just in general, the idea of making sin hard. And so if you want to get connected with people, then like be here. On, on Sunday and on Wednesday when we have Wednesday services. Make an effort to get together with Christians. Make it an effort that in your workplace or in your school that you get connected. If you can't be connected with fellow uh, Christians here, at least people who have godly values, people who value the same things you do. And the more connected you are to these godly things, the harder it's going to be for you to turn on them. And so we want to make sin difficult. We want to invest in the things of God and be thankful for the things that he has blessed us with. And so, as we sort of sum up here, sin is dangerous, it is enticing, but there are steps that we can take to keep ourselves from being sucked in by the deceitfulness of sin. Ultimately, we've got to make Christ our identity. We've got to make ourselves ready for transformation. Let God work in us and make us into the people he wants us to be. But in the meantime, let us do everything we can to make sin hard, to get connected with people, to put up boundaries between ourselves and our sinful desires, and to pursue God and his things. And so, uh, if you're here today, and you feel that you've been sucked in by the deceitfulness of sin, or you're scared, and uh, you're, you're worried, and it's, it's, it's got a grip on you, we would love to help. We would love to pray with you, encourage you, work with you. Or if you've never begun this journey to follow Jesus, to learn about him, to be baptized, and to, to begin anew to be born again, to have your sins washed away. We'd love to help you with that as well. If you have any need, please come as we stand and sing.